in terms of a, a theme for today, perhaps we could each take a turn and pick one thing that we're reading and how that reading has impacted us, what's going on now, because, you know, this it is a really, well, I don't have to say a very, very difficult, unusual, strange, unprecedented, word used too much, uh, time in the world now with COVID and the political situation and everything else, fires, I, I don't have to tell you. But also, and we all have a personal situation. You know, there's a personal drama, then there's a drama, you know, if we're involved in, 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 in communities like this when we're doing calls together, and then there's the global drama. So, you know, whatever you want to pick. So I thought we would each take a, some time and tell, tell us what you're reading and how it's, you know, what it's meaning to you and how it's helping in some way. And then perhaps we can all add to that person, whatever that person brought up, and then we'll go to the next person. Hopefully we'll get through. Please do not talk more than two minutes. Then we really can't, we won't get through everybody. But if everybody just has a conversation about it, it would be nice. I'm really interested to see where, what all comes together. You know, what is, see what, how it, what is beyond the sum of our parts. So that's what I'd be interested in. Um, so who would like to start? Just please raise your hand. Wendy. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I'm reading and I'm, I'm just loving the experience. Uh, not that because I like the topic so much, but um, my grandmother's hands, if you ever can read that book, um, it's an amazing um, trip <laughs> in the body because he, he focuses on racialized trauma is, is what my, help my grandmother's hands is about and healing it in the world. And he actually has solutions, which I love. Um, you know, one of the challenges with a lot of books I read these days, it's all about the problem, but there isn't a lot of uh, information about potential solutions and how are we working in that direction. So I, I appreciate his work. Um, sorry, I don't have the author with me right now. <laughs> it's in the other room. But um, the, um, the gift of it, I think, is realizing that this trauma is in all of our bodies and it has been there for eons and it's ancestral. It is very, very old. Um, and his focus in the book is that actually, why do white people um, traumatize black people? It's because white people were first traumatized by themselves. Um, that the ancestors who came into the country um, from, you know, myself, it's called German, English, um, and, uh, excuse me, what do you need? Okay, sorry, wife, need, <laughs> meeting, uh, apologize. So the traumatized, uh, racialized trauma, and one of the, the things is to look at our bodies. So it's, it's how is this in our bodies? How do we feel? Um, this trauma ourselves and how we maybe have push against it by projecting it out onto others, right? Because white, the whole idea is that white folks came from um, a lot of different countries. It had nothing to do with white. White wasn't even an issue. I mean, it, race, we got raced when we got to the United States. So when anybody came through Ellis Island, they had to literally be asked, this is fascinating in the book, to learn that they were asked to let go, if you had an accent, you can't speak it anymore. You can't speak your people's language. If you have uh, rituals, if they're not, they don't fit the what current white ritual in the US, you can't do that anymore. And it's very fascinating that all the people that came had been traumatized. They left trauma themselves and came to the United States and in hopes that they wouldn't be traumatized, but then they were re-traumatized um, uh, even white people were traumatized and we did, we've never called attention to that ourselves, those of us that are white, about how our family was traumatized and that because of that trauma, might we, and I think this is the big thing of the book, that we're pro we project that out because we've not healed it in ourselves. So the idea is to come home to the body and to work through this trauma in our own bodies, especially white PK handles white people, Black people and police. 
So it actually looks at three different groups of people that have to look at this differently and release trauma from their bodies and learn how to be safe literally for ourselves and for others. Um, we're not safe when we're in this broiled tension. So that, that is kind of the gist of the book. And I think it's really helped me reground because I was getting ungrounded. I don't know about you all, but I, I knew I was on the warning track when I was watching the debate and I, I literally screamed. I was just livid screaming at the TV to, you know, I, was, I couldn't believe the traumatization I was seeing happen from one candidate to another. I, I was like, why? Why is that helpful or how does that come? And so I knew I needed to do some work on my own emotional sobriety, if you will. So I, I've done two things. I actually started going back to Al-Anon. I'm going twice a week to look at my own self and uh, reground. And anyways, the book's really good about that too. So the need to ground in our bodies to hold this time. Thank you, Wendy. Wow. Okay. Do we have anybody who'd like to comment? Anne Marie. Anne Marie. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Uh, I, I found that uh, most fascinating, and I, I, I see how that can feel grounding when one sees the background of where this is all coming from, you know, with the Ellis Island um, traumatization, it really, I mean, it, I think find also it's helpful when we get a, a sense of the context. Um, I, I've often heard that asking the question why uh, is pointless because you'll never really know the answer to that question. However, it's a valid pursuit. And uh, your input here on the why, giving the background of how we're, it's passed on generations of not dealing with the, the trauma, gives us a sense of more sympathy and compassion towards where our ancestors uh, came from and what they had to do. I mean, um, hundred percent of my ancestors came through Ellis Island. My my roots are in New York City, um, um, and my grandfather came when he was in his thirties from Spain, and he, he he was so embarrassed about speaking Spanish and prideful that how he learned how to speak Spanish was from the six-year-old neighbor because he, he, he practiced English. He wasn't embarrassed in front of the six-year-old, but he refused to speak Spanish with my mother growing up. But anyway, um, I really appreciate your you're sharing with your book, and um, and I've really appreciated this because, as you also said, Wendy, it's helpful to have some reading that is talking about solutions rather than the problem, the problem, the problem. And um, this book is, you know, it's giving lists of organizations to get involved in, and you know, every single chapter has. Um, at the very end of it, a call, uh, you know, a call to action. And um, it's, it's been really great to have a call to action every, every day. So that's my. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So we're on this, we're on the topic of, um, of the racial, our racial background, really, how deep it is. And, and, uh, and we could stay on this for a little bit longer because it's such an incredible topic it's because Emily just brought in the moment of choice and I've been reading that, but I've also been reading Cast, C-A-S-T-E by Arlene Wilkinson. She's a Pulitzer Prize writer and it's an Oprah book. I think one of you might, somebody in reeditation suggested it. Yeah, well, 
I'm just, I'm blown away. I have not finished it because I can't even read it all at one time. I have to read a little bit and then go back to non-duality. <laughs> but that, in that book too, uh, she speaks about the real origin of um, racism, which she does talk about America, US, because people came here and apparently in Europe, but at that time there wasn't really a question of, of race. There wasn't black and white skin. It was more a question of, it was different questions. They had different kind of caste systems. But, you know, since when, when our ancestors, when our, our parents and grandparents and great grandparents, when they came to the United States, it was white. And then all of a sudden these black skinned people appeared that it was decided where they were going to be a slave nation. And the book is devastating. It's really devastating. It talks about like in Hitler's time, it names dates and places and people that are involved where they were studying the United States. In 1938, 1939, they were studying how did this country manage to enslave a whole race? How did we do it and do it so well and put it in our legal system? In our legal system, it was okay to kill somebody who was a person of color. It was, it was okay, you could do that. There was no, that, that was like, you know, you, you have a right to kill your dog if you're not happy with your dog, I guess. Probably you don't have that now. But it's just devastating. I can't even speak. And it's also made me like, like Wendy was saying, really question, really question that I am not, that this personality, who I, who I have been conditioned to be, and everything about me is not free of that. There are deep things that I am not aware of that that book made me much more aware of. And you know what we're not aware of, but how can we change? We think that we're, you know, not prejudiced, that we're just people who are who are so liberal and 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 very and very accepting, and we are. But there's a lot more to us, a lot more that's deeply buried. I don't like the body thing sounds incredibly interesting, but it's it's really riveted me to look much deeper into this. Ron. Yeah, I uh, also have been uh, reading very carefully A Moment of Choice and uh, focusing on several of the uh, authors in it. Um, just to get talk, continue what we're talking about, we definitely have imprinted in us, I think not only our, our histories, going back to our races, to our God knows how many eons of racial memory that are imprinted in us. And I, I believe it goes even further than that because in our biology, we have hardwired in us uh, the roots of racism, uh, which I would call tribalism at a more early stage than even racism. Uh, but what I find so interesting in A Moment of Choice, I focused on two uh, authors that I particularly loved. I found a lot of similarities in the other authors um, and the other presentations, which offer a variety of visionary have-tos in order to arrive at a peaceful society. Uh, I focused on uh, Deepak Chopra, and Irvin Laszlo, um, because they stress the fact that we have to have a direct experiential encounter with whatever we believe spirituality is, our religion, our spirituality. That without that direct encounter, uh, we're going to be caught in endless issues, endless problems. If we have time later, I have a few very short selections from the book, uh, which we can share if we want to do that. Uh, but Chopra is very out and he says the only answer is really the direct experience, the direct knowingness of our wholeness, uh, which is another state of consciousness. And 
I have always believed and felt and experienced that from another place of consciousness, there is a involuntary built-in morality which covers compassion, which includes love and changes our relationship to everything and everyone. It's in that state of consciousness. And Irvin Laszlo uh, repeats that message in a more practical way by saying that science is great at its level at pointing at our unity, but the direct experience of our spirituality and higher states of consciousness must come together in order to begin to change uh, what is happening on earth. So uh, I find them beautifully complementary and uh, very much in light of my own experience. It's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Craig, I know you can't raise your hand, so would you like to come in on this and then join me in the station words? Uh, sure. So I guess, yeah, it's, I mean, everything that's been said has been impactful, starting with what Ron just said uh, about a recognition of a different state of consciousness as being primary to our experience and that changing perspective on everything. I'd say that's been the experience in the morning when, not so much when I read, I, I've been having a hard time focusing when I read and I don't read a lot in the morning. I read short, like one or two paragraphs and I have to reread them. But then I'll meditate for a, a long while. And, and I don't always focus when I meditate, but just the act of sitting quietly and recognizing some sense of stillness is very, very comforting um, in juxtaposition of that word trauma. So I never would, I never used to think about the word trauma in relation to emotional or um, just everyday situations. I always thought of trauma as being something extremely extremely traumatic something very usually involving something physical but i guess i'm waking up to the fact that anything that's unresolved in our lives in my experience throughout whatever i consider my life is in a way trauma because it sits there in this state of um in limbo kind of the way i feel many times right now in a state of limbo where things are not resolved answers are not clear and a direction is not easily uh, apprehendable. And I think that's been the experience in a lot of different circumstances. And then uh, the practice has been, as at least it's been conveyed to me and, and suggestions have come to me to not try to apply the mental, uh, mental approach to try to figure something out that things are as they are, and if I don't know where, what, where they're going to go, what's going to happen, or how it's going to get resolved, that doesn't mean that it's not moving in a certain direction. It just means that I just don't know. So I think both the, the altered state, a different state of consciousness, and then this word trauma are very interesting this morning as I hear them. Yes, certainly. Certainly, Craig. And I keep saying all the time that we're living post-traumatic stress syndrome. <laughs> I, want, I want to find out from psychologists what you go through, you know, in post-traumatic yeah. stress syndrome, except it's not post. It's, it's present traumatic stress syndrome. <laughs> and uh, so I think, you know, what Ron was saying about the readings from a moment of choice in terms of pointing us towards something beyond just what appears in everyday life and just the, the drama that goes on and what is happening now more than ever i thank my god I, I thank everything there is every morning to know that there is something that is beyond the drama that is unfolding if i didn't have that i really don't know how what people do with it speak of present traumatic stress syndrome i have no idea jordan Yeah, I think, thanks for bringing this topic up. It's, for me, you know, as I go about my, my days in, in this, you know, this state of 
I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, a, a lot does come up and I know there are things buried in, in my being that, you know, sometimes come to the surface, sometimes they're, they're just, you know, kind of not really present. I, I don't really understand what's going on. So, you know, I also turn to meditation almost every day to bring about a sense of calmness and um, quietness. I, I'm looking for, you know, that change, you know, that to increase the state of consciousness because that in itself for me is what makes me whole and at peace and able to have empathy for not only, you know, we talk about empathy for others, but like kind of a, an empathy for myself and what I'm going through. And I, from our moment of choice, they, they talk a lot about one, one, one author, I, I think it's Joan um, Borsenko talks about empathy and her husband, they talk about empathy. And I think that's coming to a place where you, you're, you are, have a sense of that wholeness. You can begin to, to have empathy for others. You can open to empathy. Yes, Jordan. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. We're all saying, you know, there's this and then there's something, you know, else. And we're all <laughs> how grateful we are to have all those incredible writings. And, uh, I think we still have, Jordan, I think you can mute yourself. Um, all, the, all the tools that are, you know, that are there through meditation. And uh, also I wanted to say that when I wrote the, the theme for our, our talk today, I said, how is the content of meditation affecting us. But there is the, not the content, but there's something else. Like I was thinking about that, you know, it's not, we read something and it, there are words on a piece of paper and we read them and the mind reads them. And then we contemplate or meditate or something is happening with them. And it's happening for me very much in this field and this kind of like just knowing that you're there I, I don't know, I mean, I've always had that. That's been my practice for, not practice, but my beloved for 40 years. And so, you know, all this information that's coming out now, which is like a, really like a cornucopia of, of unbelievable amount given to us. And then, you know, but there's, you know, Kenneth Mills used to say, you are the tastiness to the dish. We are the tastiness to the dish. We are the force that, we're the meditation to the words. So maybe we could talk about that a little bit because in reading um, my non-duality, I think this week I was reading Muji actually a little bit here and there in between finding out about the racial things, but Muji and just that sense of how intimate the drama is with the screen, you know? There's a screen that we are and there's a drama, but this drama that's being played out on earth now this, you know, like, oh my God, I don't know what we could call it. I don't even know we could have a title. That drama is so intimate with us. It's not us completely. We're not an actor on the stage, but it's completely intimate with us. And so, you know, just that feeling that what is happening is so close. And yet there is something that stands, that, that a standpoint that's beside it, or with it, that holds it, holds it. So that's been my... Um, experience personally in the personal drama and in the global drama. So please just raise your hand as we go. I think everybody has mentioned the book. Ron. You know, just connect together. We're all, it's all the things we're talking about are so connected. Um, 
you know, in talking about wholeness or a different state of consciousness, this is not to imply that we do not need to deal with everything that's going on in our histories embedded in us. As a matter of fact, from a state of wholeness or approaching a state of wholeness, we have a standpoint from which we can begin to look at these issues non-judgmentally, which is so crucial, so crucial. Our self-judgment is horrendous, especially those who have a conscience, you know? So it just strikes me, and it's been my experience, that the ability to look at what goes on inside our personality, you know, I would call our space-time history, no matter how long it's gone, our species, our individuality that's gone through this many lifetimes, it needs, it needs a place from which we can look at it. Uh, otherwise, there's so many defenses, so many instinctive withdrawals from what we see inside ourselves. And when you read a book like White Fragility, or you hear about caste, I remember an experience when I was in medical school, I was watching the Eichmann trial. Some of you may remember that Eichmann was one of the major Nazi perpetrators of this, the ex extermination of the Jewish people. And he was on trial in Israel. He had been captured and brought to justice. And I heard him speaking and give his excuses. And as I watched this, I could feel within me that these ex excuses were there inside me as well, somehow, somewhere. It was a shock to realize that. But it changes my approach to other people. Um, and it brings a necessity of support from others and from within ourselves in addressing these issues and not flinching. We have to do that at the same time that we have the support of our own identity, looking at it. Beautiful. Anne Marie? <clears throat> Thank you, Ron, for all that. Uh, prior to reading our mom moment of choice, I was delving into uh, In Search of the Miraculous with uh, Ospensky uh, for a bit. And I was struck by him describing the world that he was in at the onset of World War I in Europe and how in, in their circles with Gurdjieff, the world was going into madness. And the, the sense of where in the world is humanity going and just the ground underneath them shifting and moving and the sense of insecurity and in what's going on. And when I read that, I thought, wow, you know, I, I, you know these, these, this is called the cycle of life and the cycle of humanity. And we're just witnessing, we're standing here, we were chose, we, we asked to be born, I believe, in this period of time to assist humanity through this very significant period of time and um, com coming to the reditation space every morning is what helps ground me in this time of shifting grounds because I'm, I'm surrounded by friends who were my my friends for years and and they are getting caught up in the um conspiracy q anon and um 
uh, and they really feel that they have the esoteric knowledge of what's really happening on the world and everyone else is blinded and uneducated and if only they knew what was really going on and they it tends to be the friends who fairly recently just came into spirituality where they really didn't have um the groundedness of reading Sri Nisargadatta and Rudolf Steiner and all those other kinds of resources, they're just coming in now fresh. And there's something so appealing about getting esoteric knowledge that just grabs people. And um, so my point is, is that I'm, I'm so grateful for the, the readings that, um, the Vistar Foundation and meditation are have given me to give me a sense of more groundedness so that I can walk and go for walks and talk with my friends and not get sucked up and to be able to have my heart go crazy when I hear them talk. You know? I mean, I mean, it just gives me a sense of just wait, you know, let's just have some compassion and just hear them out and, and go one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So true. Wendy. Yes. Um, wow. I love that piece of cycle of life that this is just, um, uh, of course, I've done big studies on you know, and um, in fact, Sunday I was teaching spiral dynamics and racism. So to a group uh, online and, you know, where does racism come up in our um, past, the history of humanity, where did it get birthed, how did it get birthed uh, in terms of the context of spiral dynamics, which is this leveled of consciousness reality. And I hear people talking about the need to move up to the next level of consciousness. In other words, there is this need to shift up, right? And all that I'm hearing here is kind of a balcony view, right? That the non-dual perspective, when we can get there, um, it gives us this pregnant space to consider the whole uh, and see the whole, to see the, you know, what lens and ask myself, what lens am I looking through? Because as I understand these levels, I'm always responding from a place in consciousness. So it's like, where am I responding from? And where am I choosing to respond from? And where can I help myself and others get space? Because right now everything's crunching in and everybody's so tense and taut. It's like, so meditation and different things that I do that help me stay spacious, like stay and see the whole and understand that we have gone through this humanity as a race has gone through this several times, the, the, the uh, level of pain we're experiencing globally. This is not just in the United States. This is a global shift. And one of the things I'm aware of is that that's helped me the knowledge of is to know that back in the sixth century and the 14th century, we had major loss of human population where uh, souls were choosing off the planet in, en masse because the truth is when we get to times like this and a lot of people are, I think, raising up the question of, is this even worth living like this? Um, you know, we, the first is we had a taste, at least in the United States, we had a taste of a way of living that was a, a higher level and all of a sudden now we've crashed to a lower level I mean, when, when you, a lot of people are just, the um, antithesis is going back to the medieval times. And what's amazing is that we're being asked, I think, collectively, uh, what kind of life do we really want here? We, we were in a certain place that was a lot better than what I'm experiencing today. <laughs> and I'm going, wow, you know, once you've had something, you don't like to give it up. So that gives me a lot of hope. In other words, so, on the whole, everyone has known a bit better than what we're experiencing right now. But the level of pain that creates these crises always comes when a new level of consciousness is landing on the planet. According to Spiral Dynamics and Integral, it's the green level that's landing. And so taking hold of the planet. And I think that our moment of choice is the book that 
is very uh, in that vein. Um, is, is, is the green moving through us to this bigger place of wholeness so that we can actually step up into the place where we can see the whole thing. And last thing I, I just want to share is I've been doing, um, during this time of doing a lot of shadow resolution work um, on myself, because what I've also learned in learning this spiral dynamics and these models is that often we went through the um, lower levels unconscious. We, we were not aware or awake to what was going on. So we might've gotten some of the gifts of that level, but we may not have, have resolved all our trauma from those levels. And so what's starting, I think this whole picture is we're going back to, we're, we're collectively doing a shadow crash. I, I believe it's like a collective shadow crash down to a lower level um, to say, clean it up down here, you guys, like get this trauma out of your bodies. This is, you can't have it in your body and think you can go higher <laughs> with the body in stress. You can't. So we almost have to, I have to come down and I am reverting, I guess, and consciously going down to the lower levels, my beige, my purple, the tribal level with the purple, which is so old, which is really raising up its head right now. And of course, one of the pathologies of the green level is it reverts to tribalism. So the esoteric thing that, that Amory was talking about, you get esoteric in green and you, you, there's a pre-trans fallacy is what Wilbur calls it. And you revert back to tribalism, thinking that that's great. In fact, we should all just go back and be indigenous. No, no, that is not the answer. Um, no, we are not gonna go and just go around the campfires and keep murmur. I mean, and it's a good thing to do. Chanting's good. There's some great skills from that level, but it's not the place to live from a whole space because it puts me in my tribe versus your tribe. And then the other, and I'll throw this book in for you, but it's called Dignity for All. And I think it's part of the solution is us getting this lie, this, this lie that caste recognizes, that my grandmother's hands recognizes, is this whole thing that we have to allow ourselves to recognize how we may have come up some levels, right? We green people and above, but we didn't do a lot of our healing down at the lower level and it's part of the problem because we don't go there and we deny it. So anyways, I'm going to let go of that, but I could go on. I'm just, this is, I don't know, a stream of. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's just so much knowledge that uh, is available now. Isn't it amazing? It's amazing. There's only a few of us in this call and we've already gone through <laughs> centuries, centuries of, uh, so I'm going to put in, uh, one more thing about this, and that is what uh, was we were talking about in search of the miraculous. When I studied, worked, worked as a, the word for the Gurdjieff system for twelve years, and one of the things for me now that has come to really to bear on what's happening is what the Gurdjieff called the law of the opposites. And so, I really um, I'm aware that um, that we are so pulled to take positions. So pulled, and again, there's a, a bestseller novel, Why We're So Polarized, if you read that, this is not our decision. All these things that racism, we, we are not consciously saying I wanna be polarized. And you know, really, you know, I have no racism, nobody's doing that. There are things that are, as being said, just big, deeply there, but the idea of taking sides has been pushed on us. You know, people used to uh, split their ticket, Republican, Democrat, it's become identity politics, they call it. And the word is identity. And for me, who, who's, uh, you know, greatest love and greatest, you know, just, I guess, I guess, I can't even call it a goal, but my greatest being on this, on this earth is to experience, to not, I wouldn't even say experience, to recognize, to keep recognizing and being, discovering the depth of my true nature, I know that if I get polarized, <laughs> I'm got, like on a screen becoming a really good Democrat, you know, a really good Republican. So I try, I try consciously not to go all that emotional way, like just to keep it there and just to know that that is coming from the outside. I mean, none of us like to be manipulated, but we don't know because the mind really is polarized. It's dual and duality wants us to choose a team, you know, the red team in color war or the blue team and I'll fight to death for my red team or my green team, my yellow team. 
So I just feel aside from what is happening relatively that may be true and, and very disturbing, still I try to very much to be aware of being, being manipulated into a side and taking arguments and just to just keep that mind a little quiet in terms of that. So that's, that's one of the things from Gurdjieff that we're um, putting in there. Um, Craig, I wanted to see if you and Jordan would like to say anything before we close up. Um, sure. I, I mean, I think this has been riveting and I think the, you know, the, the last part here, I think that's the only breath of fresh air. The only time I can relax is when I step back and remember that, um, that this is not as permanent as I think it is in the immediate moment or in, in the history of the world, meaning that life is, life is something else than I, than I maybe perceive it. Um, and it's certainly the thing about taking sides, I found that I, I, and this, this, I was always like this, like I was like this when I was a kid, if there was a bunch of people and they took a strong side, I would just take the other side because I couldn't stand to be included, like they automatically included me and they assumed that I agreed with everything that they stood for. And I can't, it's something in me just refuses to do that. And I'm not saying it's a good quality, but I have found myself arguing for sides that I don't even agree with just because somebody else assumes that I agree with them, which is idiotic. <laughs> um, but stepping back from that, I think as we, as we start to close the call out, I think that coming back to a, uh, that point of nothingness, which is everything, has been the only um, respite that actually then I potentially could, can act from a more neutral perspective. That's been the biggest challenge to act, to still act, but a little more of it, like you're saying, a little more of a neutral perspective and not so impassioned for my point of view, um, but still act in some way and still speak in some way. That's been, that's been the practice. Thank you, Craig, that, that's good, very good. Okay, Jordan and then Ron, you could finish it off, Jordan. Yeah, I think for me, um, just the morning, well, for me, it's more of a midday practice is to more fully experience um, not just the content, but just the feelings, the feelings that are, that are coming up from meditation. You know, at times it becomes very emotional, becomes a very emotional experience and that for me is becoming more fully human when I, when I take in those emotions. So, um, yeah, I, I, for me, it's about experience both sides and everything in the middle. So. Okay. Ron. Uh, firstly, I, I so much appreciate each one of us and what we bring, you know, to these simple considerations together. Uh, there's such depth to it. You know, um, I kind of ask myself, what, why do I feel such deep pain at what is happening now, even with the overview, even with the acceptance on many different levels, but the pain I can't get rid of because it's too deep. And I try, I just look at it and I realize that there is something so beautiful in the vision of America, the Republic and its democracy. There's something so beautiful. It represents ideas and visions which have been with humanity forever. And to feel that in jeopardy is where the pain is coming from. The unnecessary trampling of something beautiful. I can't get rid of that pain, even though I can put it into a larger perspective. So that's where I'm at.
So thank you everyone for being here and for being on meditation because I've been getting these pings on our text group, you know, and people you're saying things like, you know, that's the best part of my day. <laughs> you know, I have to say it's the best part of my day for sure. But something, you know, that's just something about it. I, I don't know what, but that that, uh, and I love doing it on the text group. I think it's really great to have my little phone there, this wonderful little iPhone that I love. And, and then, you know, I just get on there and there's, I, I say sometimes my meditation is just the comments. I don't even have to go meditate. I can just read something that somebody wrote two, two hours before and just go, oh, I'll sit with that for a while. So it's, um, it's really, really a blessing that, uh, you know, that you're here and that, we're doing this and, uh, you know, and so, so it is, as they say. Okay, and thank you again. And uh, Anne-Marie, last word. I just wanted to make a shout out for D. Oh, yes, okay. You know, just to have a shout out for D and um, the videos that she, she is to send to us, my phone collects the videos in one spot. So I can go back to my phone and watch Dee. And she's, and she's with us. I wanted to put a shout out for Dee. Thank you, thank you, okay. All right, can I mute and just say goodbye and um, I will ping you tomorrow morning. <laughs> Bye. 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 Blessing. Bye.